Welcome to another edition of the podcast known as Blending the Family. I am your host, Tommy Maloney. Welcome to a repost, a replay, a reincarnation, a regurgitation, whatever other R words I can use. But hey, before we get started, I want to mention that the pre orders of the new book, My Dad's Advice at 504 AM, is up at the landing page at the website www.mydadsadvicebook.com www.mydadsadvicebook.com 20 but 20 blah, 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 20 dollars plus 5 dollars shipping come on you can't beat that and super excited that we are nearing the end of that chapter where the book is going to be out soon. Anywho, thank you for supporting uh, the book. Thank you for uh, buying the book. And I know many of you, many of you are going to be buying the book. You are. You're going to love it. And as I've told a lot of the, (coughs) excuse me, <clears throat> Keeping that in, um, I am going to tell a lot of the ladies is that don't ignore, or let me rephrase that, disregard the name of the book. And here's why. I actually wrote the book um, to showcase and spotlight dads, okay? However, here's the caveat to that, and that is... As a former ex-husband, I'm probably the biggest dickhead towards my former spouse, and I am a great dad. I'm going to tell you that, and that's why I wrote the book. I want moms and ladies to see that there are wonderful dads out there, even though we can be dickhead ex-husbands. So please, please. Go out to the website, mydadsadvicebook.com. www.mydadsadvicebook.com. Hey, so this is um, Erica Ann England, who was fascinating. She was an awesome. Matter of fact, uh, the night we recorded this, she was celebrating an anniversary, and that anniversary was. When actually her and her husband were married and now are divorced. And if it wasn't for her and her husband, former husband, I should say, getting married, they wouldn't have the family, the kids. So very cool that they still celebrate that. Um, So who is Erica Ann England? Uh, Erica curates divorce lifestyle support content at www.splitdecisions.pro and speaks publicly on the benefits of mediation, positive co-parenting, conflict resolution, and life after divorce. Super excited to share with you once again this interview, this conversation, this, this, I have no other words. I have nothing. I've got absolutely nothing so i'm going to move forward and say erica england is our guest on this episode of the podcast blending the family and as terry cruz would say your success is my success now go to my landing page of my dad's advice book.com and go buy several copies of the book thank you all right erica In honor of two of my favorite entrepreneurs, Bert and John Jacobs, the creators of Life is Good, I'm going to steal something from them or borrow, you know, we'll say borrow. Tell me something, Erica, tell me something good that happened to you today. Goodness, something good that happened to me today. All right, this is little, this is a tiny little thing, but I incorporated my business two years ago 
and I rebranded, put so much thought and work into the rebranding of what the business would look like. And I had an old mug that my old assistant who previously worked for me had made with my old logo. And I loved it so much that I used it until it was chipped and it was broken and shattered. And this morning when I woke up outside my door was, if you could see me, you could see it. She had made me a brand, a brand new mug with the new logo. And it just makes me feel like my practice is now complete. Uh, my little brand new logo mug is totally and a lovely way to start the day. That's awesome. You know, drinker? Yes. So perfect. Perfect. Because I know as, as a fellow coffee drinker, there's a certain, there's a couple of mugs that you just have to have to start your day off when you're pouring that cup of joe. You get it. And th so when you have a sentimental mug, you do, you do not want to let go of it no matter what. But um, finally, I can retire that other mug and the new one's moving in today and we're all going to be a happy family. <laughs> One big happy mug family. Exactly. Ooh, that's a good. I like starting. I, I needed something good today. Really did. So let's just start off with, uh, I loved, uh, thank you for the information for your bio. Um, I felt like a stand-up comedian sent me that information and it a lot of the little things that you sent me which will be incorporated into the show notes made me laugh and one of the things that really stood out erica was um never won a case the attorney who never won a case exactly i speak about that and introduce myself that way to people and ask them if they think that they would hire an attorney who never won a case. And I love to see their reactions of um, disgust and pity as they look at me <laughs> and think, no, I wouldn't hire an attorney who, who never won a case. But obviously there's a, a story there and it's where it brought me to where I am in my life today. Keep going. I, I'm, I'm intrigued. I think the listeners might be intrigued of a lawyer who never won a case. It started for me, the very first case I actually lost was at 1.30 in the afternoon, the day I got sworn in as an attorney. So I got wow. sworn in by the judges and my boss said, go to court at 1.30 in the afternoon. I had been an attorney for about two hours and 15 minutes and <laughs> got sent in. Uh, I think it was a support modification, I don't remember. And uh, you know, I, I lost. And that was sort of to be expected, judge ruled in the other person's favor. And then as I began to be more comfortable in court, I noticed that very often we would go present our arguments and I would lose. But more often than I would lose, we would settle cases. So you show up in court with your client, the other attorney shows up with their client and you're all in the hallway trying to cobble together a deal in the six minutes you have before the judge calls your case. And what tends to happen is that attorneys really create a lot of pressure to make their clients settle. And the way that they tell their clients to settle is, well, the other person's really unhappy with this settlement. And I know you don't like the settlement, but a good settlement is when both people are equally unhappy with it. And that horrifies me. You know, when at least when there's a winner and a loser, you have a winner but a settlement is known as two losers and any family lawyer will tell you that so every time i lost i lost every time i settled i felt like i lost because the client had an outcome they didn't want but there were times that i won there was a domestic violence case i had that was terrible a property division case i had that was um, atrocious and complex but these were so emotional and so expensive. And by the end of the process, I saw that my client, technically the judge had ruled in their favor. But when looking at how much it cost, how long it took and just the level of destruction that it caused in their lives, I felt like I couldn't really say that's a win. So when I was losing, I was losing. When I was settling, I was losing. And when I was winning, I was losing. And that was really the first time that I thought about getting out of family law entirely. 
but it was what I did. It was all that I knew. I thought that I could be a person who made a difference in a, in a difficult system. And it was a tough period in my life to know that I was walking into court every single day to lose. And, um, but I didn't know what else, where, where to go next. How long, how long did you stay? And I never understood this in the world of, uh, your former law profession and, and medical, how long did you practice? I, I, I don't get it. Why are we practicing? You, sh- you should have been, you know, on the A team. Why are you keep practicing? Anyway, how long did you uh, stay in, in family law then? I stayed in family law litigation, like litigating in the courtroom um, until early 2011. So it was about five years that I litigated. And during that time, I started transitioning into mediation. But then in March of, oh, sorry, March of 2010, so four and a half years, I went to Mexico with my now former husband, and we had this lovely villa, and we were whale watching, and we were eating nachos, and (laughs) we were going on like little nature walks, and I was just sobbing the whole time in Mexico, like eating nachos and crying and watching whales and crying. <laughs> that sounds like a great date. It was, it was good for both of us. <laughs> we got home and my former husband said, you know, you have to change your life. And that was in March of 2010. So um, pretty soon thereafter, I shut down my litigation practice and started a brand new mediation practice. And I haven't been in court since then. So still acting as an attorney, but only working as a mediator. And all I do is win, to quote DJ Khaled. (laughs) All I do is win. (laughs) Or um, uh, what's his name from Two and a Half Men? Um, Oh, Charlie Sheen. Charlie Sheen. Winning. Winning. (laughs) Winning. Yeah, there you go. I, I I like DJ Khaled better though. So, well, I'll take all the winning you can give me. <laughs> Every day. Well, it was funny because when you were talking about uh, going into a court, and even though you you settled and that was a loss, the first thing I thought of was Stephen Covey's uh, Seven Habits, and he talks about that would be a lose lose situation. So. You have no winners. It's just a lose, lose situation. It absolutely is. In fact, I've read the seven habits and I work within many of the structures of that book in my practice. Now, mediation itself is talking about people's interests. So what do you want to see happen? What are you afraid of? What are you concerned about? What's your best outcome? And court is about positions. I want $1,800 versus I'm going to pay $600. And so whenever we're setting positions against each other, it looks like a zero-sum game. It looks like a lose-lose. The amazing thing about mediation is we just step out of that and we say, what are all of the things that both of you want? And then let's create an alternative that's serving each person's interests. It's a really magical way to get people from digging in and staring at each other to stepping back and looking at a, the bigger picture. Why is family court such a, um, and I'm trying to think of a, I don't have a positive word for it because going through my own trials and tribulations of family court, but why is family court such a, I don't, I, the only word that comes to me is, is, is scam. That's a word that very many people use. And this is my opinion. I, I'm a disruptor. I have created an entire process outside of the court system. So um, there, are, there are quite a few people in the court system in my area that, that um, don't like me at all, which between you and I and the listeners, I consider a wonderful compliment. Um, but I, in my own opinion, I think it's two things. It's first that it's very hard to measure the concepts between family by the same standard that we 
measure guilty versus innocent, for example. So if you're in a car accident, we need to know, were you guilty or were you innocent? But if you're a parent, how do we evaluate parent A is good and parent B is bad? Right. The, con the concept itself is just ill-suited to an adversarial environment. And then what happens is that attorneys are ethically obligated to pursue every action that they must take in furtherance of the client's rights. At the same time, they are financially motivated to take every single action they can take in furtherance of the client's rights. And what happens often is that we see attorneys utilizing this ethical obligation, quote unquote, to do a lot of unnecessary work and stir up crazy amounts of conflict so that they're able to generate more income from a divorce. And when our clients get in and they sit on either side with their attorney and their attorney says, I'm going to get you X and I'm going to get you Y and you don't have to worry about this. As, as people, we hear that outcome, we invest in that outcome, and then it's very hard to give up our way through. So I think the system sucks people in by giving them um, some power, some voice, and then they have an attorney telling them, listen, we're going to get you what you want to get. But what clients don't know is that that's one client to that attorney. But that attorney has thousands of other clients, and the attorney is going to want to pr pr um, protect their relationship with the other attorneys, with the judges, with the experts. So there's all kinds of levels of, I don't want to say um, side deal here, but there are layers and layers that attorneys work through that sometimes their client is really not their first priority or even their second or even their third. Well, here's, and you bring up a great point about priorities. And this is my view and my view only comes from my personal experience. My personal experience was uh, when my former uh, spouse took me to court because uh, according to her, our son vocally said to her, I want to move uh, to Wisconsin, to out of state. And I don't believe that for a fact. My thinking is that her attorney, and again, I'm thinking, especially in the law practice, there, there needs to be, I don't know, maybe some rules about ethics. I don't know. I'm not an attorney, nor do I play one on the podcast. <laughs> but my thought process would be her attorney saying, you know, he's a good dad. Um, this, this is not a good um, case. I, I don't feel that this is something I want to take on. But unfortunately, they're not going to say that. Well, they, that's not the way that they make any money by saying exactly. Yeah. And we also are indoctrinated with a concept beginning in law school that our job as an attorney is to fight for the client and to tell the client's story. So when you get into the family court system, you see attorneys that are making outrageous, outrageous, ridiculous claims. And you know that the attorney themselves knows that that is a ridiculous claim. But we are taught to believe as attorneys that it's not our job to evaluate whether our client has a reasonable case. It is our job to fight as hard as we possibly can for what outcome that client is looking for. And this is incredibly difficult to integrate into family law, where we're talking about homes and children and moving. And um, it, it can be very sad as an attorney to see um, when, when one has to fight for a, a case that they don't support. It happened to me as a baby lawyer when I was working for other people. <laughs> and they said, here, take this case. And I was like, oh, have you looked at this case? Um, there's so many reasons why. But they just said, no, take the case and tell the client's story. The, this concept of having a personal responsibility to help people get the right outcomes is non-existent in the family law attorney world. 
it's the attorney responsibility to help you get the outcome that you're willing to pay for. So, I mean, in, in many senses, it, it is a scam. Yeah, I, as I'm going back to that, that hor- not just that horrific, well, it, I shouldn't say horrific. I mean, the very blessed that the uh, judge ruled in our favor that uh, he was not going to allow my former spouse to take our son out of state. But getting to that process cost, uh, I maxed out a credit card, had to borrow money from uh, my now wife, had to borrow money from a, a, a family member. And it's just insane. And it's money you'll never, I mean, it, part of me is, well, that's money I'm never going to get back. But at the same time, if I hand spent the money, then I'm sure, unfortunately, my son would be in the land of cheese right now. <laughs> exactly. And, um, you know, it's really unfortunate that you got the outcome that you wanted. But even today, even though that was years ago, you look back on that and you see the pain and the stress that it caused and how much money it took away from your support of your family and your dreams for your financial future. And that, that's why if I were your attorney, I would have said I didn't win. Cases like your case are the reason why I got out of family court. It, it wasn't that I hated dealing with awful, mean, terrible people. It was that I hated seeing good people just get destroyed. Well, it, it's funny because the other night I was watching one of my favorite movies and it makes me cry, um, Mrs. Doubtfire, because, you know, I felt like Robin Williams in, in the court scene when he's trying to fight for, you know, justice and having, uh, you know, equal visitations. And I really found it interesting that even in the movie, and the movie came out back in 1993, I'll never forget the the judge said in in the movie, yes, it's a movie, I get it. I know people are probably rolling their eyes at me right now, but Tommy, it's a movie. I know it's a movie. (laughs) But he did say that back then, um, how important it was to have the father in the lives of the children because, you know, majority of the time, the the cases always were won by the mom because sure. that's, that's you know moms are nurturing dads aren't and it was just a, a lovely piece in the movie to to show that how important it is that co-parenting means in my view you have both parents involved not just it being co-parents as one-sided, you know, the dad pays, you know, their, their child support and doesn't see the kids. It's they're part of their lives and how important that is. Um, and again, I, I just found it interesting watching that movie and seeing the importance of that particular scene, just to show that we need more in real life, more, Uh, family court judges to recognize that. How far do you think we've come since 1983? You know, that's a great question because I still talk to a lot of my uh, guy friends, my dad friends who still feel that it's, it's not, it's not equal. It's still not equal. We haven't, we haven't come far enough in family court when it comes to, uh, judges recognizing the importance of dads being in their children's lives. I, I don't think we've come far enough, quite honestly. That's that's sad to hear when we think about a movie that you said came out in 1983. 93. Um, 1993. Oh, 93. So the, like, but the level of progress that you would have imagined that we'd have made by 2020 is just still not there. And quite honestly, Erica, I, I feel that if the judge in my situation was, was a female, I I really don't think 
the ruling would have been in my favor. That's interesting. Have you heard that same experience from other dad's friends that you yes. have? Yes. Yes. Interesting. There are some counties up here where there are only female judges on the bench. So I'm interested to talk to those attorneys and see what they know about that. Like, yeah. I wonder if, if there's some implicit bias that even the most neutral judge doesn't know that they're exercising if she's a mother and she's saying, okay, I, I have a hard time separating a mother from her child. It's easier to separate a father from their child. What um, what advice and tips can you offer the listeners for better co-parenting in your experience? Oh, gosh, I have so many. How many hours do we have? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm uh, here. I have, I, have a, <laughs> I have a bottle of wine chilling, so at one point we'll have to take a break so I can open it up. But other than Beautiful. that. Beautiful. Perfect. Yeah. I'll do the same. Um <laughs> So, I, I mean, very first, I think that the, the very first thing is to be able to get right with yourself about the split. As long as we are carrying guilt or shame or anger about the split, then we're going to be projecting those feelings onto our former spouse. And it's basically impossible to have a partnership when you are carrying around those extreme feelings that come along with divorce. The worst are the people who get divorced and they think that they don't really have any feelings about it. Like, actually, no, I'm doing fine. I'm ready to move on with my life. Um, and you're, and you're thinking, wow, this is all going to implode. But whether it's therapy, whether it's reading a book like uh, Gabrielle Hartley's book, better apart is so good that I've been giving it free to some of my clients. I'm like, you need this so much. I'm giving you each a copy. Um, but a book like that or an online course, there are much more affordable options than getting into a big, long therapeutic relationship. But just doing something to become right with oneself and finding perspective on what happened. And then we're less reactionary um, to bring us back to Stephen Covey. And we're able to be much more proactive once we've settled down that emotional component. That's maybe the hardest thing to do. And I'm suggesting to your listeners that they do that first, but almost like building the foundation of the house. If you get that right, then your chances of having a structure that is solid, that keeps everybody safe and comfort um, are, are so much higher. I'll never forget uh, a, a friend of mine when I was going through my divorce, he gave me some great words of wisdom. And you're talking about, you know, the house and the foundation. He said, when you are going out uh, picking furniture for yourself and your son, make sure he's involved in that decision. I'm like, I, I never thought of that. That I thought that was brilliant. And sure enough, um, I mean, I, I, I kind of guided him towards which bedroom furniture, but I mean, we still, unf I don't know, if, I think he's outgrown it. I think I need to get him a new bed, but he's 17. He'll be out of the house, college next year. So why waste the money now? But I thought that was <laughs> uh, a great tip that, that I heard was yeah. having the kids involved. That's actually one of the things that's included on my list of how to talk with young children about divorce. I have an age by age step-by-step -step list that's broken down developmentally. Would you like a copy of it for your readers? Yeah, that'd be great. I can add to the show notes. And one of those tips is to absolutely include the children in the building and the creating of their new space because it helps them feel like they've got some ownership in that space. And it's fun for children to get new things. So whether your family budget is you, you're going to the Goodwill and picking out some things, or you're going to Pottery Barn. It's about the child creating their own space for themselves. Also, I should note, maybe you don't have a room for your child. Maybe, maybe you share a bedroom with your child because you're in a little space. It's still getting the, your little guy a set of dressers, a bucket of toys, their own little bed, and letting them create their space in there. That's what they're going to remember about it. They're not going to remember, um, you know, how big or fancy or important a house was. 
how it, it's how comfortable they feel there. So your friend, that's a great tip and it's um, one of mine. So obviously I think it's fantastic. <laughs> but, what, oh yeah. What, what does the research say about kids under 10 and you know the impact of uh, conflict? You know, without being able to specifically break it to children, kids under 10, because the research I've seen goes a bit, goes a bit higher. Um, it's, this is interesting that you bring this up because we often think that it's the divorce that quote unquote ruins a child, but it is not the divorce itself. The conflict is usually a big part of it. And children that are in high conflict homes and then are living in low conflict homes post divorce, actually our research shows they do better after the divorce because though they're dealing now with two different homes and make different financial circumstances they're not living in conflict day to day and you know we've all very recently been through this covid scenario together and we we've all been living in a place where we don't know what's going to happen from day to day and that is a very uncomfortable place to be we know about conflict that children get incredibly physically and emotionally stressed when exposed to it. So the first thing parents need to think about when they say, oh, we're staying together for the children is, it, well, what kind of home are you creating when you're there? Are you able to stay together in a low conflict manner? Because if you're not, then it could actually be safer for your children to be in separate homes. Older children, um, when I did a radio show, my partner on the radio show, he, his parents got divorced when he was 17. And he said he had been waiting for years. And when it finally happened, he was so relieved because he knew he wasn't coming home every day to this explosive, dramatic anger. So conflict is my wheelhouse. It's, it's my baby. And what I like people to recognize about conflict and co-parenting and in divorce is that yeah, it's, it's awful for children and it doesn't matter whether you're married or whether you're separated or whether you're co-parenting, the, the conflict itself is incredibly difficult for kids. But the wonderful thing about that is it's totally manageable. Even if you have no control over your spouse, there are wonderful resources that can help a person manage their own conflict and really put out the fire on their side of the forest. So the good thing about conflict is um, it can be tamed. Uh, I don't know if, if this will mean anything to you, but I, I was, I'm, I'm always curious asking, I always like to ask uh, experts about this and their thoughts and feelings. Um, so your, your two children were very young when you and your former spouse uh, divorced. Yeah, one in three. My baby was still breastfeeding. My son and I, ironically, were about the same age. When my parents divorced and when his mom and I divorced, it was about five years old. And so how do you think that impacted you for it to happen at that age specifically? You know, that's a great question. <laughs> I don't have an answer other than I saw the only thing I, I can recollect from my parents' marriage was, you know, the day it all came to an end when my dad uh, left. And I took that memory and when my former spouse asked for a divorce, and I didn't want my son to see me in that same way. I, I didn't want him to see me leave. And I, I don't, I really wish I could figure out if it was a coincidence or, or, or I really wish I had a better answer, Erica, but I just find it ironic that we we're both around the same age when it happened i do my my question though is along the lines of conflict is do you feel or or even with the research that the younger the kids are the 
the more apt of okayness they are after the divorce versus uh, an older child going through it or is it or is it the other way around there there are good and bad components of both so on the one hand my daughter who's now nine she remembers my former husband and i living together and she was three when we split um, and I always thought it would be so terribly sad for my youngest, Spence, he's, he was one, that he would never remember us living together. So I did delay the divorce because I wanted him to get to this point of understanding what our family felt like together in one house and having that memory. But then years later, asking my daughter, she, she really only remembers the times that her dad and I were fighting because she was three and a three-year-old is going to remember wonderful, amazing things and scary, traumatic things. And so she, the, these memories I thought I was giving her of all of us in one home, what she took out of it was the time she felt unsafe. My little guy, he doesn't remember us living together, but he also, he doesn't remember that conflict. So he has so much less of an anxious personality than she does. And I, I I do think those things are somewhat related. With these younger guys, if they're not going to remember the, the good times of, of the parents living together, the good thing is they're also not going to remember the bad times. And the bad times can be really traumatic for a younger child. With the older children, though, I think that developmentally, because they very often blame themselves for divorce, there's the potential for a lot of problems if the parents are not able to go to the child and directly and specifically say, you did not cause this. This is not your fault. And you don't have a responsibility to fix this for mom or for dad. It's our responsibility to keep us safe and to keep you safe. And you're going to be okay. It's so rare for parents to have that short conversation with children that are a bit older and to blame themselves. And they will, we know research knows, carry that guilt and that shame and their, um, that toxicity through the rest of their lives. Older, older children, um, we know, can either use the parents to triangulate each other. They know the parents are fighting, so they're going to use that conflict to their benefit so that they can go out and smoke pot behind the ceramics building. Like, not like that's a thing I ever did in high school. There's no way. But just like as a side example, these children triangulate their parents to try to get their own way when they're a bit older. So or the divorce happening at that time is difficult, too. I think there's only there's there's two good times to get divorced and and one of those is when you look at what's happening now and you look at what your future would be like without your spouse and you know that it would be happier and healthier without your spouse that's when you say I have to get divorced the other good time to get divorced is when your spouse says they want to get divorced because you don't have a choice so if your spouse says you have to do it, then that's the other time where you have to realize, okay, I have to like get suited up and get ready to move into this. But there's no perfect age is the bottom line here. And okay. there are certainly, um, for families that want to stay together for the children, I would say, look at the level of conflict and what life are you children actually living? What are they learning about what a marriage is? How safe do they feel? And if they feel safe and they're learning good things, then there may be no reason to divorce right away. But often children are much more perspective, or, um, they, they much more, they see much more, I should say, than parents give them credit for. You, oh my gosh, I am I'm reliving a lot of good memories. Um, good thing that bottle of wine is not that far. Um, the when you said about, um, uh, let me put it to you this way. When I was going through my divorce, I was on uh, a phone with one of my dearest, bestest friends, uh, my buddy Chris. And Chris had gone through a divorce. And he said, if you take your son out of the equation, would you want to stay married to that person? And immediately I'm like, no, he goes, 
there's your answer. Work on your relationship with your son. Work on building, you know, a foundation of staying connected with him. That's what was important. And when you were sitting here uh, telling me that, you know, the two different ways, I'm going, oh my gosh, it's, it's, it seems like common sense, but it's not common sense. Oh, and it's so emotional. It's yes. very, it's quite difficult in the middle of the storm to stop and say, is this a good time to get out of the storm? Or is this a storm that I'll be able to ride out? And it's lightning and thunder and, and hail and rain all around you and you can't see much. So it's, when we look back on it, it may, we may say, oh, you know, maybe I should have done that years ago where that was really clear. But I certainly have a lot of empathy for people that live in the middle of that storm and they don't know what direction to go. It's so hard to see. Um, this might sound like an odd question, but uh, when I was going through some research and um, wanted to come up with some questions, I, I was at, many years ago, I was at um, the local chapter of the National Speakers Association here in Colorado. And I was talking with a lady and she was asking me what, you know, my niche is. And I said, well, I'm still working on that. I'm trying to figure out, you know, at the time I was divorced, I was a single dad. And I'd said to her, I mentioned my, uh, my ex-wife and she looked at me and she was from, I think she was from London. And she found that amusing because she said, that's not a terminology uh, they use. They don't say uh, ex-wife or ex-spouse. They simply just say, our, our former spouse, and then I just I just cut it out and just say my former. What do you currently call your former husband? Is it your ex husband? Is it your former? Is it Bob? I don't know. Uh, I love to know this about you because I picked it up when I was looking at your TED talk and through your research and the things you're doing about promotion of positive fatherhood that you refer to your former wife in a respectful way. And mm -hmm. I, I actually use the term former. I wrote an article on LinkedIn, anybody can check it out. It says, I don't have an ex-husband and neither should you. Um, but it talks about the importance of the language we use during divorce and how that language shapes our experience and our children's experiences. My use of the word former came from a couple of years before we were divorced listening to a story on national public radio where they were talking about the difference between ex-military and former military mm -hmm. and they described ex-military as being someone who was dishonorably discharged oh. whereas former military is someone who was honorably discharged and this is for example why we have a former president of the united states and not an ex-president so this made me think, well, if they both mean discharge, then could we start using the word to, to, to uh, indicate that they were honorably discharged? It's a softer word, and whether people do or don't know the linguistic connotation behind that, it sounds and feels more respectful. And I'm a strong believer in even if you don't feel super respectful right now, start <laughs> using the respectful language and you'll notice it'll soften both of you up. So yeah, I refer to my former husband as my former husband. Um, and he and I, I are not perfect. We have conflicts in our relationship. But no. Yeah, a former, I know. A former family attorney would have conflicts. In, hold on, I'm trying to do this with a straight face. Yeah, not going <laughs> to happen. I know. This year has been interesting because it's been the year that I realized that I was doing something that women tend to be the per the ones that do this traditionally called gatekeeping, where I was the person who handled all of the little tasks and the uniforms and the shortcuts uh, and the, what the things that were booking the children to do and uh, school tuition, and doctor appointments. And I started to get very resentful that my former husband didn't understand how difficult it was for me to get everything done. 
So I started giving him some tasks to do, like, ha, huh, this will teach him. Then he would go and get the haircuts and they would come back. The children look like serial killers, like the <laughs> haircuts. And then I'm mad. Like I sent you a picture, you couldn't even get the right haircut. Um, and then I realized, oh, 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 the point of gatekeeping is, it is control. So if you let your former husband take the children to the haircuts, but then you criticize how well he's done it, it's still you keeping control. And Hallelujah. Um, Thank you. And the nicest thing we can do for them and for us is to say, take them to the haircuts. And then when they come back, no matter what, you know, yard implement it looks like was used to cut their hair, you just say, thank you. The haircuts look great. And then as the person who just lost control over a task, now instead it's just me gaining free time and it's my former husband picking up more of those day-to-day -day responsibilities and just blooming under them. Like as an example, he's a teacher. So during COVID, he did all the teaching for the children. Oh, I wow. did none of it. Um, I taught them things in the afternoon, like we put together a mock trial uh, <laughs> about whether Carol Baskin did or did not kill her husband and the tigers. Oh yeah, we it, yeah, it was. It, I've, I I've, seen, I've seen attorneys that lacked the level of professionalism and gravitas that my seven and nine year old did during this trial, but their dad did the schooling, and so I, it's something that really resonated with me about what you do with promoting positive fatherhood is that when we allow men the opportunity to step in and and we tell them you're not going to be criticized you're going to be doing it differently than we're doing it but, but you take over these day-to-day -day tasks and you get more involved that they get to build a deeper connection with the children and it creates a lot of pride with them themselves and that's one of those things that i see as win-win so this was an interesting thing that kind of we've gone through in the last year and a half with my former and I um, didn't create a lot of conflict, but I, I learned a big lesson. Hopefully if your listeners take anything from this, it's, um, it's the control that was really creating the conflict for us in that scenario. And when I was able to let go of that control, I got free time. I didn't have to go to haircuts. Win, win, win. Okay, Erica. Um, you're celebrating a unique anniversary today. Yeah. Is it today? It's I am, today. uh, because I don't, I don't want to say anything yet other than this is very unusual. Well, yes, it's unusual. Um, I know we haven't met, but this is, this is a, a freak, uh, situation because you're going to get people to say, I can never do this with my former spouse. Yeah. Let's talk family anniversary, and happy family anniversary, by the way. <laughs> Thank you so much. We're going to have champagne and cupcakes later. And actually my whole family's coming into town from various places tomorrow. So we're going to get together and have a, a whole entire extended family anniversary. Um, but so one of the things that, that I think we see if we have friends that are divorced is that their anniversary is a day that's difficult. It's a day where they look back and remember the happy day and then they come forward and they take all the, oh, this, but this is a marriage that failed. So it's some, for some people an awkward day and for some people it's a sad day or an angry day. Um, and the very first Time, our anniversary rolled around. My former husband and I had just um, just submitted the divorce paperwork. So it was very, very new. And um, I didn't know how I was going to feel about it, but I hadn't said anything to him. Um, you know, it's a weird conversation to have. I guess you just think you no longer have an anniversary, so why talk about it? But on June 5th, on, on that day that we got married, my daughter, who was three, out of nowhere came up to me and she said, mom, I was at your wedding. And I said, you were? And she said, yeah, I was there. And I said, oh, tell me what that was like for you. Because for your listeners, little tip, if you have no idea what to say to a child, because they come up to you with something out of 
totally out of the blue. Tell me what that was like for you is a good tip. <laughs> it buys you some time. Uh, I'm writing that down. <laughs> and she said it went outside and there were flowers and there was sunshine. And we, uh, my former husband and I had gotten married in a tiny little vineyard in a tiny little town called Clarksburg in Northern California, wine country near the Delta River. And it was sunny and there were flowers and it was beautiful. So I took my wedding album out, I showed my daughter and we looked through it together and she was telling me how she had seen in her dream all of these beautiful, lovely outdoor flowers. Wow. And I realized as sad as an anniversary is when we're divorced, had we not been married, we would not have these two children. For us, the children came directly out of the marriage. So that was the day that we think that, typically we think our marriage began on that day. And I asked my former husband, could we instead look at this as the day that our family started? Because even though we don't have a marriage anymore, we have a family still. And really without that day, this family wouldn't be here. So let's have some cake and champagne and let's start celebrating this as our family anniversary. And every year we get together, usually we're in Tahoe, but not this year because of travel restrictions. Um, but we get together and we get our um, wedding like engagement glasses out, the real Mikasa crystal, and everybody gets to have champagne or, or bubbly apple juice and talk about how lovely our family is and how happy we are to be in part of this family. And we cheers and we eat cupcakes and that's about it. It's a very small little ceremony in and of itself, but the big shift that it creates, if anyone's able to possibly imagine this in the future, is looking at that day as the beginning of something wonderful. And then every year that the anniversary comes around, it's not a negative drain on you. It's actually just a lovely little reminder of this is why you have your babies in your arms today. And your spouse may not want to celebrate family anniversary with you, but you can celebrate it on your own or with your children. It doesn't have to be all together. It's just one of those, to get back to Stephen Covey again, my gosh, this guy, it's a paradigm shift. And oh, we're, yeah. we're taking something that feels to us like a negative and just in the way we're looking at it, it feels positive now. And everybody I've shared this story with, they're like, oh my gosh, this is great. We're doing a family anniversary. Because who doesn't want an excuse to drink champagne and eat cupcakes? I mean, really. Uh, oh, gosh. Uh, you had me at cupcakes. <laughs> so, yes, we're doing that a little later today. And um, I'm excited every year for it. One of those things I share with all my clients and anybody that I can is just um, try it out. Pop a bottle. You know, again, Erica, that's... I could not, I mean, my, my former spouse and I are, are, we can't even be in the same room still. The only way we communicate is through email. That's it. And the funny thing is she'll talk to my wife <laughs> to not necessarily go through my wife to get to me, but they'll have conversations. Um, and I find that funny. I don't um, like my, my wife, her former husband and I, you know, we'll talk. I mean, not much, but it's 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 comfortable. I'm not still comfortable after twelve years. I think it's twelve years. I don't do math very well, Erica. Uh, I think it's hey, you're, twelve. Hey, years. You're, you're talking to a lawyer. So. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know my rights. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry, that was something different. Um, after 12 years, again, we, we still cannot uh, have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And do, you, do you blame yourself for that at any level? Do I? No. Perfect. No, because, because I've tried. And my, and my wife has seen me try Good. Uh, on several occasions. But it, it's okay. You know, it's a it's a beautiful way to manage conflict to recognize the things that we can impact and that we cannot impact. So just to bring you back to what are some of the things that that I recommend to people to help their co-parenting and lower their conflict. One of those things is you can stop trying. You are not under an obligation to try for the rest of your life if your former spouse 
is never going to help you make that work. Give it a good effort, but then stop. And if you feel like, you know, shame or guilt or blame, or you could have kept trying, then, then keep trying or go to therapy. But for you, Tommy, to be at a place where you're peaceful with the fact that you have stopped trying, and I, I imagine that if she ever came to you and wanted to have a really constructive relationship with you, you'd be open to that. That's a healthy and a lovely place to be, um, to be able to have drawn that line and created that boundary. Tell me your thoughts on, because again, you've, you've mentioned this and, I, and I'm very blessed you have, that I, I try and keep a positive mindset when it comes to even the world of divorce, but what are your thoughts with the way uh, you, you, you hear these two schools of thoughts because of COVID? Either you're going to see a lot of babies coming out in, you know, in January, or we're going to see a lot of divorces because now people are literally quarantined together. People are spending more time together that uh, they're not used to. What are your thoughts when it comes to the relationships? And do you feel that there will be possibly more divorces? Or do you feel that maybe it's just the media being the media? That's a couple questions. I'll break that down. So as far as babies, I saw an internet meme that said, nine months from now, there's going to be a lot of first children which I thought was hilarious because if anyone has kids, like, you know that COVID is probably not a time where you and your spouse are engaging in a lot of sexy night times. Um, and you have your children <laughs> driving you crazy already. It's not a point where anyone's like, let's add more kids. <laughs> If there is a baby boom in my in nine months, I'm I'm putting all my chips on. Those are going to be first babies. Divorcing, I think there are two different camps. There are the cooperative and the non-cooperative. Non-cooperative people that have been upset by what has gone on are going to be more upset by everything this this pressure put on us with COVID. They're going to be looking for somebody to blame, and that someone's very often their current spouse. And they're going to imagine things are going to be better without you, so they're going to hire a lawyer and they're going to go to court. And I do believe there's going to be an uptick in divorces, not my clientele, but people who go to court. They're, those are people that they're just mad, they want out, and they want somebody to blame, and something's got to happen now. But I think my clientele, they tend to be cooperative and more collaborative and they take more measured steps. They're looking at the fact that the economy is incredibly uncertain. One or both of them could lose their jobs. They've lost a lot of money in the stock market. Many of my clients, bonuses have been cut. Um, stock grants have been cut. So they are instead preferring to wait it out and not make a move right now until they feel like they're on more stable financial footing. I even asked my boyfriend, he got divorced almost exactly a year ago. And I said, if this year were that year, do you think you and your former wife would have split? And he said, there was no way. There's so much uncertainty. Um, uh, it, um, and we didn't hate each other, we lived together. So my theory is, if there's an upswing in divorces, it's going to be divorces that go to court. It's not going to be divorces for people that mediate. That won't happen until we're feeling a little more financially stable. And so um, I think it's mostly media driven. Um, on the other hand, I have some wonderful married couples and partner couples that have told me that this has brought them closer together and that they've gone through this challenge and they've parented as a team and they've learned things about each other that have been really good for them. And I haven't seen that reported in the media where some people are saying, as a family unit or as a relationship unit, this has really strengthened us because I have seen quite a bit of that as well. I think it's very interesting the way of the world with the technology and the way we are now communicating um, 
because I'm going back thinking there's a lot of technology I wish I had when I was going through my divorce. Tell us about your technology. Thank you for asking. There are some amazing ways that people have to manage their own divorces in ways that you and I did not when we divorced Stephen P. I know you spoke to Michael Daniels, the, the creator of the Fair Co-Parenting app. Yep. And he he created that because he was having his own struggle in trying to manage a schedule with a former spouse. And they had to constantly talk about who's picking up at some summer camp and can I switch this day or that day? And every interaction that they had that was an opportunity to create conflict. It got to a point where you don't even want to talk to your former spouse at all. And everybody's stressed all the time. So he created this amazing app to help the parents just deal with schedule changes over the app and not have to engage in that conflict. So long before I met Michael Daniels, I was working with an organization that is doing the same thing, but for child support expenses and reimbursement. This is called Support Pay. You can find out more on supportpay.com. And Tommy, I do have a discount code for your clients to get 50% off for the year if they want to try it. What the, uh, uh, I'm speechless. Thank you. Erica. I know. I had, to go, I had to go to the CEO and then she said, she said 30% off. And I said, you know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> she said 50, okay. <laughs> So if your clients go to the support pay website and they just put in the discount code podcast 50 podcast 50 they can get a year for half off so wow what this program does really similar to michael's if your listeners heard that is it helps parents manage the payment of all their child support and expenses without ever talking to each other about it i don't know if you've ever had divorced friends and they're like god if i just never had to talk to my former spouse again about money i would be so happy or divorce friends. Oh, hold on, Erica. Yeah. Divorce friends. You're talking to me. I don't want to talk to my former spouse about money. It's I don't want to like, talk to her, period. Hello. <laughs> uh, so many people don't. And the thing with children, people who don't have them don't know this, but man, they are so expensive. And their expenses don't come once a month, like when you're running a business. It's it's constant. It's like swim lessons, and then it's tuition, and then they need a new uniform, and then a haircut, and then they're going on a field trip. So you're constantly racking up these expenses, and a court order usually just says split expenses. And so this means for my clients, they're usually drawing up these very elaborate spreadsheets, and they're trying to show this is how much we owe, and then they get in a fight about, well, why is it so much, and where's my money going? And support pay just eliminates all of that by putting them in a structure that's kind of like Venmo, but super private, just the mom and the dad. And so when dad gets an expense because he takes the kids to the dentist, he just scans the receipt, the QR code, inputs all the info, sends over to mom the amount that she owes. And just like Venmo, she can kick that expense right back. And she can dispute the expense if she doesn't think that that's an appropriate expense. So it sets the disputed expense aside and it doesn't interfere with the ongoing accounting. It's a banking system really just for child support payments and expenses. What we love about it is it keeps people out of court because they have something to manage this discussion about money. They're not getting conflicted and conflict is what gets people into court more than anything else. But for people who do go to court, the app pulls together all of their records in a legally admissible way. So instead of hiring your attorney and paying hundreds or thousands of dollars for them to create the spreadsheet for you and make it admissible to the judge, you right away just have the documents to hand over and your case is made right there. So what we love about it is it's designed to help parents avoid that conflict of talking about money. But if that doesn't work, it's also designed to help you get in and out of your court case with so much less out-of-pocket expense. Again, I'm sitting here going between you, Michael Daniels, uh, Marco Munez who with uh, Decomply, I really wish we had your uh, your technology, because I really believe that it's something you just said. 
a lot of people wouldn't even have to bother going to court because you would have already had that information. And, and correct me if I'm wrong on this one, Erica, but to me, it sounds like instead of having to go to court, you would just have mediation, less money, less stress. What do you think? Oh, well, mediation is significantly less money and less stress. And when we have something like records that can just be produced, it's so much simpler, right? I see more and more people choosing mediation as a first option. And I see people choosing utilizing our new resources and our new apps and online divorce services like Aaron Levine's Hello Divorce or uh, Laura Wasser's It's Over Easy, in addition to the professionals you've already brought up. People are looking more to have more of a hand in their own life and to take more control rather than to turn everything over to attorneys and judges. Whether that looks like we want to mediate because we want to make the agreements and we want everybody to win, or we want to start using some technology that helps us communicate better and helps keep us out of court. All of these things that people are doing right now are really shifting a lot of business out of the court system. And I mean, I, for one, couldn't be more thrilled with that as an outcome. Uh, I'm going to use your own words again from Stephen Covey. It's a paradigm shift. It's a paradigm shift. And you said earlier something about uh, there should be more rules <laughs> or uh, there should be more laws about attorneys and ethics. But here in California, at least, the attorneys are the ones who make the laws about attorneys. So I don't believe that we are going to see major change to the family court system coming from attorneys. I think we are going to see people working outside of the system to provide other resources like support pay, like hello divorce. And the people are going to be more empowered to take a different path. The more people that take this path and the happier they are with the outcome, the less support the family court system will have. And eventually I see that really falling apart. There are always going to be people who need it. They need domestic violence restraining orders or like in a situation like yours, a, a move away. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no easy way to mediate a move away when you have somebody who's die hard ready to go. Um, but, but I am seeing, I, I'm not looking at the legal world and telling them that they have to make changes I am now in the business world and I'm in the mediation world. And instead what we're doing is we're actually providing real ways and, and real alternatives for people. It's exciting. It is exciting. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, Gabriel Hartley, um, you know, past you guest. You love her. I, I love her. She's, she's hilarious. Uh, turn on the mic and just let her go is, is uh, what I like to say. But between, you know, you, Gabriel, uh, Michael, um, and Marco, and, and the other people you've mentioned too, I really do feel that there is the positive uh, aspects of divorce. And I think in, in my view, what you all are trying to accomplish is the key thing, and that is staying out of court because that is, you know, that's time. Wait, it could be wasted time, wasted money. When, when all we have on this planet literally is time. And when we start taking time away from our kids and then money that we have to shell out. And now you smart people, because you guys are, are taking the time and money and now we can put it back into what we parents want to do spend time and occasionally money on our kids to give them uh, serial killer haircuts <laughs> whatever yeah edward scissorhands yeah <laughs> whatever you like as long as i'm not the one doing it exactly all each of us each of us that i know in uh what gabrielle refers to as the positive divorce movement and i refer to as cooperative divorce all of us Unfortunately for our personal lives and unfortunately for my own bank account, we all feel like we have an obligation to do this work. And once these ideas have come to us and we've developed these companies, even though this isn't the first alternative to most people that are divorcing, 
we know that we are serving a huge group of people and a growing group of people. And if we weren't here doing what we were doing, then people would not have any alternative support. And a really, re really um, cool research study we have by Robert Emery that tracked people for 12 years after they were randomly assigned to mediation versus randomly assigned to court shows us that even with these random assignments, mediation made a big and powerful difference. Children had better relationships with their parents 12 months later, and the, I'm sorry, 12 years later, and the parents had better relationships with each other 12 years later. So we're talking about not just getting people out of court, which is a bad thing, but also creating these opportunities, mediation, the apps, the technology, for them to make their lives better for it to be a more positive experience for them for the future. Even though this is a small group right now, it's a growing group and I feel very honored to be a part of it, to be here talking to you about it at all. So thank you. No, thank you. Now, why didn't you invent this 12 years ago when I was going through my divorce? Right? Yeah. I, know. I have I... to blame somebody, Erica. I'm, yeah. I'm not going to blame me because I've gone through therapy and I'm a good person. <laughs> Um, um, this is the, there's such a fascinating history to this company, and right now we're in seed round, so we're generating, we're looking at generating our next round of up to ten million dollars for expansion of the company nationwide. But once we get through that round, I'll come back with you, Tommy, and I'll talk with you a little bit about the founder and the incredible story that she had, the challenges that she reached in her own life that created this product. Um, but it very much like you, like Michael Daniels, like me, we were, we're creating something because what we went through was so powerful and in so many ways, so negative, we had to create something good out of it. So I'm, I'll tell you that story over a glass of wine on the future podcast. I'm looking forward to it. And, um, I, I will, I will say as, as I've said to many of the guests, you have an open invite anytime, Erica, anytime. Well, I, I'm a middle child of a very large family. And so anyone who's willing to listen to me talk is a friend of me. Aw, I'm an only child and I talk to myself a lot. <laughs> uh, before you let me go, I do just want to take a minute to tell you that I appreciate very much what you're doing in the promotion of positive fatherhood out in the world. And want you to know that there are so many women and so many mothers myself included, that are on board and would love to know more about how, as mothers and as women, we can support that movement to bring fathers more into the household, to let them do the haircuts, to lower the gatekeeping. So if you've got anything on that that I can share, I would love to. I think these two groups can work together to create a lot more change and we move farther and farther away from Mrs. Doubtfire and, and more into a world where a parent has the opportunity to be a caretaker, a bath giver, a breadwinner, all of those things at once. I love what you're doing and really can't wait to see more of that. Oh, thank you, Erica. The, the only thing I, I would say is as dads, it's okay to tell us hey, the yard looks great, or thanks for putting gas in the car, or uh, thanks for walking the dog. That's great, Mom. But what we really want to hear more of is, even from our former spouses, we really do want to hear that we're good dads. We're great dads. We're, you know... We're there for our kids. We're not the so-called, we went out for a pack of smokes and didn't come back. We support our kids. And uh, I just had a good friend of mine on this podcast, uh, Scott Moreau, who is one of my heroes when it comes to not just positive uh, fatherhood, but positive blended family. And, you know, I, I look at, my my dad friends we 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 want to hear that we're good dads 
not that, hey, thanks for mowing the yard today. Thanks for vacuuming. You know, that's great and all. That, that doesn't do anything for me as a parent, really. And not, it's not, I hope it's not like, you know, having our ego stroked, Erica. It's, women are different, obviously, that you ladies will get together for a glass of wine and you'll, you'll talk in a positive way saying, you know, that, that dress looks great on you. I like your shoes. I like your hair. Um, you're not going to get that from guys. What you're going to get from guys is, hey, your yard looks great. Hey, tell me how, you know, you know, what, what kind of car are you looking at? I think it comes from women. We need the women to say to, to us to start that conversation. And so as men, then we can turn it around and say to another guy, I think you're doing a great job as a dad. You're doing a great job as a husband. And if we can get that support from women, there will be more positive men out there knowing that they're, they're doing their best and that they are really good, great dads. Um, for example, uh, John Francis, who started the Father's Eve movement, where he says that it, it's about getting together with your buddies. And a, a lot of the, the guys I've talked to have been part of this Father's Eve movement. They talk about how positive it is and that they can share feelings and they can say to one another, how can I help you? If you're hurting, how can I help you as a brother? But it starts from the women, Erica. It starts from moms saying you know, to their husbands, to their former husbands, I think you're doing a great job as a dad. I love that because it's free and it's simple. And there are so many, you know, there's just so much advice out there in the world about how to have a better marriage or a better co-parenting relationship and advice that is free and simple is the very best kind. I think you're, I'm hearing from you that what would really resonate with dads is if we just see them and we affirm and validate a little task that they did. Oh, oh, I, I heard you reading that book to our daughter and I saw how happy she was and you did a great job. Or we send a thank you for something that they did. Um, maybe know that they're gonna do things differently than we're gonna do them. But like I was talking about earlier, they still did it. So thank them for doing it. And I right. think you're saying the more that we're able to build up the men in our lives, our husbands, our co-parents, then the more that you are able to be there for each other, the stronger you become when you have a, a fellow co-parent or friend that's not getting the affirmation or the validation that we need. So that's a little thing that a woman can do that really can create an impact that will spread. And I think it's a beautiful idea. I'm going to, we have Father's Day coming up, which is the one time of year that some people think And this inspires me, Tommy, to write a piece about how uh, we can have Father's Day every single day of the year, just by creating a simple way to recognize and thank the men in our lives for the things that they do. Thank you. And it's like, uh, I know you and I have uh, been emailing back and forth, and I, I'm very grateful that you're the one person who's watched my TEDx talk more than once, um, that all I wanted to get out of that message was, as dads, yeah, we know we're late occasionally. Uh, what impact is that making on our kids' lives? It's nothing. And, you know, one of the things that used to drive me nuts was uh, Sundays when I would drop my son off with his mom at the standard neutral location, and I would get... 10 minutes down the road and already my phone is getting emails from her letting me know how badly I screwed up that weekend. I screwed up his homework or I forgot to pack something or, you know, it, it's one of those situations where you then sit there and going, I'm a bad dad. That's all I am. I'm a bad dad. And As somebody who's battled depression for many, many years, 
when you hear that over and over again, then it starts resonating. You know, oh my gosh, I'm a bad dad. I'm a, I was, I'm a, a I was a bad husband. Um, I was a, a bad child. I mean, it goes down the road. Sure. But if if we can take that piece out, Erica, and reverse engineer it, and just say thank you for, like you were saying, you know, thank you for, you know, helping with the homework, you know, thank you for making sure, you know, most of the stuff was packed for his, in his backpack. I think that's what co-parenting is all about is taking out the emotions as far as you did this versus thank you for doing this. Absolutely. It's this shift from um, feeling that each of us do it better than the other. And there's all kinds of problems. And as soon as we look at the other person, we see all of those problems and it's evident that we're perfect and they're a disaster. (laughs) Right. And again, very, very often that dynamic comes out of court because that acrimonious trench that you dig for yourself the minute that you go into the courthouse becomes deeper and deeper and deeper. And it's incredibly hard to see over that trench, see the good things that the person is doing. Um, But it's so, it's so simple, isn't it? To say something nice. And if this is the first time that you say something nice to your former spouse, you might get a response that is sarcastic or disbelieving or what do you want? Or are you trying to manipulate me? So to any of the moms who are listening or the dads who are listening and they want to take this opportunity to pick up their phone and shoot a quick text to their spouse and say, hey, thanks for doing the haircuts last week. They look great. And your spouse writes back and says, what do you want? Or where does this coming from? Or why are you doing this? Because that happens in a high conflict relationship. Um, You know, just, just keep doing it. And eventually your spouse is going to start to believe the things that you say about them whether you're saying a lot of good things or a lot of bad things, right? They'll begin to eternalize the good. I just did it. While we were on this call, I texted my former husband and told him, thank you for the haircuts yesterday. Um, He had kind of screwed up the schedule and I got mad that he screwed up the schedule and he said, I'm sorry. And I said, it's okay. It's, it's fine. And I was looking at that text exchange and what I didn't say was it's okay. It's fine but thank you for taking them and getting it done. And they look great. So while we were on this call, (laughs) um, I have sent him a text. (laughs) You can't do that on your family anniversary. Well, you can't do it at all. Exactly. And I want to get you to your family anniversary. um, Before, before I let you go, supportpay.com 50% off uh, podcast 50 is the uh, discount code. Uh, Erica, thank you, your CEO, for doing that. That is super cool. Last question, though, Erica, last question, and that is, Erica, what has changed in your life in the past 12 months? Oh, wow. Um, well, I'll try to be quick, but this it's a, it's a very personal answer. You said you have dealt with depression in the past as have I had postpartum depression twice. And last year I contracted significant treatment resistant depression. Um, That's the kind of depression that's so bad that you have to cycle through all kinds of medications to try to figure out which one works. And um, so I didn't work for months last year. I went through a tremendous amount of of pain and um, challenges and and sadness and difficulty and I almost lost my business and um, then I got through it and and stabilized and got back on track and sort of started reclimbing the hill and rebuilding my business and as soon as I got my business stabilized COVID happened and so it has destroyed the business overnight essentially because like I told you we don't have cooperative people that are divorcing right now. So what is so exciting about this is that it comes in at the same time that I have the opportunity to work with support pay, that I have the opportunity to launch my own software divorceably, 
you and I can talk about that in the future. And just this week, my children and I launched an organization to help children promote peace. Uh, it's ipromotepeace.com. And we're using the events happening in the world today as a prompt to help parents give their children ways to engage in peaceful action. So in the past 12 months, it's maybe Tommy been the biggest roller coaster of my life from doing very well to getting quite sick, to building myself back up, to having everything disappear overnight. But over the edge of that cliff, there were more opportunities. And the next 12 months of my life are just gonna be tons of fun to watch all these opportunities expand. Uh, I want to make sure I have this written down correctly. Is yeah. it I support peace.com? Like the letter I, the letter I promote peace. Oh, I, promote I promote peace. peace. Okay. Yeah. Dot com. The, the children and I started that, uh, just, just a few days ago. So there's not too much on the site, but we work on it every day and they are learning that when there's difficult things happening in the world, that there are things that they can do little things, big things, essentially that even if you're a child, there's something that you can do to create some peace in this world. And so far we have made $16 for our charity. So they feel like they are wildly successful. That is already. successful. Yeah. <laughs> Good for them. Good for you. Yeah, thank you. And my business is Divorceably. It's at D-I-V-O-R-C-E-A-B-L-Y, divorceably.com. And that is my current practice, the mediation that we're taking into software that will be the nation's first software designed exclusively for couples who are divorcing together. But that's another podcast. That is um, another podcast. The last 12 months have been, there's been so much growth and change and opportunity at a time when I was telling the universe, like, I don't need any more growth. Thank you so much for the offer. I've had, I've had enough growth and change. And the universe was like, no, I don't think you have. So I'm actually really excited for the next 12 months. And I love to see the more I work in the field of cooperative divorce, the more people I meet like you who are out there doing incredible things for people. Um, every day out of their own experience, it's been a joy for me and it's really, really lovely to meet you and to be a guest on your show. Like I said, Erica, you have an open invite anytime. Uh, Erica England, I, I don't know where to start. Uh, Supportpay.com, uh, Divorce of, uh, I can't even speak. Divorceably.com, grab my other notes. I promote peace.com. Oh my gosh, your, your new coffee mug runneth over yeah i know and i do think it's fair now that it's five o'clock in california to fill that new coffee mug up with a nice cold beer i'm gonna go bust out the the wine um and i hope i'm you know what here's what i'm gonna do i'm gonna have my wife and i tonight we're going to toast you and your family for your family anniversary tonight and I'm going to send you a picture of that. I would be delighted. We would be thrilled for you to celebrate with us. We have worked really hard to become the family that we are today. And I'm proud of us. So thank you for that. By the book.